50 years after we last left footprints on the moon, NASA's Artemis 1 is our first bold step towards getting us back there and pushing us farther than we've ever been before. You are looking at the world's most powerful rocket, an Orion spacecraft, live on Launchpad 39B. Artemis 1 embodies the hard work of thousands across the world, determined to explore for the benefit of all. This briefing at 90% go, really the only concern being the thick cloud layers rule and a very small concern for the cumulus cloud rule. But overall, the weather is looking favorable. As I said, right now, weather is go. Those clouds are high enough and thin enough where we do not expect them to be a concern. So I'm happy to report a very favorable launch forecast as we head closer to T0. Now the fully stacked SLS and Orion system was rolled from the vehicle assembly building uh, to the launch pad about two weeks ago. We captured this video of the four mile, nine hour journey. It took a special transporter and a special team of people to make it happen, hear from them what it's like to shoulder the weight of this moment. The crawler transporter is a, it's a machine that goes and picks up the mobile launcher, the SLS rocket with Orion. It's basically the cornerstone of the mobile launch concept. Without the crawler, you couldn't transport the mobile launcher and the vehicle from the VAB to the pad or the pad back to the VAB. And it was designed and built for the Apollo program to move Saturn V to the launch pad. Um, since then, we've modified it and used it to move the entire shuttle program. And after the shuttle program, we did extensive modifications and now it's to be used to move Artemis to the launch pad. The crawler is 136 feet long from end to end. It's 114 feet wide from the edge of the truck to the other edge of the truck. It weighs 6.6 .6 million pounds. It has the power to do two miles an hour, but you never want to go that fast. Generally, we're around 0.83 for SLS. Artemis will be one of the heaviest loads we've ever carried and one of the tallest loads we've carried. I am exceptionally proud of our team. They're very talented, they're very committed, and they're, they're just all around good team. I think uh, we'll, any problem that crops up or anything that comes up, we'll fix it and we'll get moving again. And, and again, it starts right here with the crawler. So if we do our job and everybody else does theirs, man, we're gonna have a successful launch. We're going back to the moon. This is gonna be just fantastic. go and rock rock is go all right copy all and launch director ntd our launch team is ready to proceed at this time i copy all entity at this time i will proceed with my poll and attention on 232 this is the launch director performing the final poll for launch verify no constraints and go for launch egs program chief engineer EGS Program Chief Engineer verifies that the EGS, SLS, and Arroyan Program Chief Engineers have no constraints and are go for launch. Copy, Greg. Thank you. EGS Chief Safety Officer. The EGS uh, CSO verifies the SLS, Orion, and EGS CSOs uh, have no constraints uh, and are go for launch. Copy, John. Thank you. Range weather. Weather has no constraints and weather is go for launch. Copy LWO and Mission Manager. And Mission Manager, Launch Director. Launch Director, Mission Manager on 232. The Mission Management Team has been pulled. You have a go to proceed with Terminal Count and Launch of Artemis 1. I copy all, thank you. And Entity, Launch Director. Go ahead, Launch Director. Yes, sir. On behalf of all the men and women across our great nation who have worked to bring this hardware together to make this day possible, and for the Artemis generation, this is for you. 
At this time, I give you a go to resume count and launch Artemis 1. Copy, Launch Director, and thank you. All right, we do have a couple of steps to configure, and then we will be ready to resume the clock. CVSE, NTD. CVSE here. Initiate recording of Orion cameras at this time. In work. R, NTD. RSR here. Perform the booster ignition, SNA, arm rotation, enable. NDT, RSR, booster ignition, SNA, arm and rotation enable is complete. And I copy. Thank you. 014744, 147 a.m. Eastern Time and 44 seconds. We went straight into terminal count. Liftoff now nine minutes away. So terminal count. Control has been given over to the GLS, the ground launch sequencer, a computer and software that is doing all of the commanding and monitoring of the space launch system. We'll hear call outs from the GLS operator, Alex Pandalos. as well as NASA test director Jeff Spaulding. GLS is pre-tensioning the umbilicals at this very moment. You can see them as they run down the rocket. That's getting them ready to detach. At liftoff, those arms will swing away, will let go of the rocket in a clockwise direction. minus eight minutes and counting. The GLS is uh, performing up to 100 commands per second, inclu including configuring ground systems for power transfer to the rocket. GLS is turning on cameras, recording video inside and outside the crew module to collect data for engineers. Purging the aft skirt booster with high flow nitrogen. Clear out any hydrogen gas that may be there. You can see the crew access arm is already retracted. When there is crew during Artemis II, it would happen at T minus six minutes but out of abundance of caution, they went ahead and retracted the arm well ahead of liftoff. Want to point your attention to the base of the mobile launcher. If something wasn't done to reduce the power from the pressure caused by the rocket's ignition and thunderous sound, it could damage the rocket. So the ignition overpressure and sound suppression system will flood the mobile launcher with water. You'll see that sequence start at T minus 17 seconds. Now coming up in less than 30 seconds, the ground launch sequencer will start bringing the high energy systems online, starting with core stage pressurization. Fire room one is completely silent as they listen for the next call. GLS is go for core stage tank pressurization. The core stage tank is now pressuring, pressurizing to flight levels. The replenish valve to the liquid hydrogen tank now closing. The liquid oxygen tank will come a little later. Now we're arming the, or the Orion ascent pyros and transfer to internal power. The launch abort system, or LAS jettison motor, is now armed. On this flight, the abort motor is inactive because there is no crew on board. Up next is the flight termination system, or FTS, which 
gives the Space Force the ability to destruct the rocket if it goes in the wrong direction. Let's listen in for that. GLS is go for FTS arm. The flight termination system is now armed. Coming up at four minutes and 40 seconds, a big moment. This is where the RS-25 engines and their bleed go to high flow. It's been a little tricky to dial in. GLS is go for LH-2 high flow bleed check. Good word, we've passed that. The cryo team got the LH-2 engine bleed pressure loop dialed in. They are now at the right temperature for launch. Countdown continues. T minus four minutes, 15 seconds. Up next, GLS fires up the KPUs. Those are high speed turbines which provide pressure to hydraulic pumps that steer the RS-25s. Stands for core stage auxiliary power unit start. GLS is go for core stage APU start. That now leads to the thrust vector control test at T minus two minutes and 30 seconds. That can proceed now, and we will see the engine's gimbal at the bottom of the core stage. At T minus three minutes and 10 seconds, you will hear the go for purge sequence four. That's a helium purge of the four core stage engines downstream of the propellant valve, getting the air and moisture out. GLS is go for purge sequence four. And in just a few seconds, GLS will close the core stage LOX vent, liquid oxygen, the white vapor cloud caused from the super cold gaseous oxygen condensing the water in the atmosphere will disappear. You see it coming out there now. And there it goes, it's closed. Locks vent closed, pressure rising in the core stage locks tank to flight levels. Coming up in 15 seconds, look for that thrust vector control actuator test. Engines will gimbal. And there they go. The four core stage RS-25 engines gimbling around, testing the ability to steer the rocket into space. They will operate at 109% performance, each RS-25 throwing down a half million pounds of thrust, all four, two million pounds, all together with the boosters, 8.8 .8 million pounds of thrust. GLS is good for upper stage to internal power. Now the upper stage has gone to internal power. So power is removed from the rocket's upper stage, the ICPS, and it's been switched to battery power. The same milestone is coming up for the core stage at T minus one minute and 30 seconds. GLS is go for core stage to internal power. The rocket's core stage, which houses the three flight computers, is now on battery power. So there is no more hold time available because there's no more margin on the battery. So if we hold, have a hold, we'd have to recycle back to T minus 10 minutes and recharge those batteries. The count continues. A note now, shortly after liftoff. One minute. Shortly after liftoff, Mission Control Houston will take control of the rocket, and my colleague, Leah Cheshire, will take over commentary. T minus 50 seconds and counting. Coming up at T minus 33 seconds, the GLS will hand off control to the ALS. This is the autonomous launch sequencer. On board the rocket, it will take over command and control of the rocket. But the ALS will check, make sure there's no holds coming from the ground up until T minus GLS two seconds. GLS is go for ALS. And we are go for ALS. The Space Launch System is now counting down to liftoff of Orion on its maiden voyage to the moon. Launch team can no longer recycle the count. Sound suppressor water now flowing 15. under the ML. And here we go. 
10. Hydrogen burnoff igniters initiate. Seven, six, five, four stage engine start. Three, two, one. Boosters in ignition. And liftoff of Artemis One. We rise together back to the moon and beyond. All four RS-25 engines on the core stage and two solid rocket boosters now propelling the vehicle at 128 miles per hour. Hearing good, con good control on the roll from teams in Mission Control Houston. All good calls so far. Now 30 seconds into the flight of Artemis 1. First milestone will be for the vehicle to pass through max Q at about 1 minute and 9 seconds into launch. This is the greatest period of atmospheric force on the rocket. now traveling 607 miles per hour. You're looking at 8.8 .8 million pounds of maximum thrust. Quiet here in the loops in Mission Control. The four core stage engines are throttling down ahead of passing through Max Q. traveling at 1,420 miles per hour. The four core stage engines are back at maximum thrust. The next major milestone will be for the solid rocket boosters to cut off and jettison at about two minutes and 11 seconds into the flight, so about 30 seconds from now. Again, quiet here in Mission Control Houston as teams continue monitoring the flight of Artemis 1. We're now 16 miles downrange from the launch pad at Kennedy Space Center, traveling over 2,800 miles per hour. Standing by for solid rocket booster jettison and shortly thereafter. confirmation that the solid rocket boosters have separated these 177 foot boosters. Now the core stage continues to power the flight of Orion, all four RS-25 engines firing, traveling over 3,400 miles per hour, 46 miles downrange. Two minutes and 36 seconds into the flight. Hearing nominal calls here in Mission Control Houston. We've still got four good engines on the core stage. Next up, we'll be looking for the service module fairing to separate. This is three 15 by 15 foot fairing panels, providing structural support, protecting the service module. Those will separate at about three minutes and 11 seconds into flight, and very shortly thereafter will be followed by the launch abort system separation. Just over three minutes into the flight of Artemis 1, now traveling over 4,060 miles per hour, 83 miles downrange. We just had confirmation that the service module fairing has separated. And that the launch abort system pyros have fired, separating those from Orion as well. For future crew members. We just heard the call for three engine press, meaning if SLS were to lose an engine at this point in the mission, we could still achieve a nominal mission. We would just have an extended main engine cutoff time. However, we still have four good engines, all at maximum thrust right now, powering the first flight of Artemis at 5,200 miles per hour, 148 miles downrange. We're four minutes and 16 seconds into the flight of Artemis 1. So far, we've had a clean ascent. We saw those solid rocket boosters jettison about two minutes and 11 seconds after liftoff. Shortly after, we had the service module panels fairings separate, as well as the launch abort system. The launch abort system was inert for this flight, except to perform this separation. 
Those four core stage engines will continue to fire and power the flight of Artemis One, now traveling over 6,800 miles per hour, 229 miles downrange. Booster flight controller reports that the engines are looking good. Our core stage main engine cutoff time is about eight minutes and three seconds. We are now at five minutes and 11 seconds into the flight, 7,656 7, miles per hour. Again, four good core stage engines, those four RS-25 engines. The last time those core stage engines flew, they were taking space shuttles to orbit, and now with upgraded capabilities, they're launching the future of human spaceflight. Five minutes, 42 seconds into the mission. We are now traveling 8,800 miles per hour, 345 miles downrange from the launch pad at Kennedy Space Center. Again, we are anticipating core stage main engine cutoff at about eight minutes and three seconds. And about 10 seconds later, we'll see core stage separation, at which point Orion and the interim cryogenic propulsion stage will be flying free. Now traveling over 10,000 miles per hour, six minutes and 15 seconds into the flight of Artemis One, 427 miles downrange. Quiet here on the loops in Mission Control Houston. Teams continue to monitor this first flight. About a minute and a half now until that core stage main engine cutoff time. Our four core stage engines continue to fire maximum thrust. Coming up on seven minutes since launch today, now traveling over 12,800 miles per hour, 563 miles downrange. Again, still quiet here in Mission Control, Houston. As we prepare for main engine cutoff, the four RS-25 engines are beginning to throttle down. Thirty seconds now until core stage main engine cutoff. All four engines continue to throttle down. Now seven minutes, 45 seconds into the flight, traveling over 16,000 miles per hour. Continuing to hear good calls here in Mission Control Houston. We're standing by for core stage main engine cutoff. And we have confirmation of core stage main engine cutoff, Orion, and it's now in Earth's orbit. The flight dynamics officer reports that we have a nominal main engine cutoff. And we just heard the call for core stage separation. That means Orion and the interim cryogenic propulsion stage are now flying free from the core stage of the space launch system. The next milestone will be solar array deploy approximately 18 minutes after liftoff. Control Houston still monitoring the Artemis One mission and the first flight of Orion atop the space launch system. So far, we saw successful liftoff at 1.47 a.m. Eastern time. Um, all the way through separation from the core stage, we now have Orion and the interim cryogenic propulsion stage flying free. And we've just heard that we have initiated solar array deploy. So we are turning our focus uh, to that. The spacecraft was running on battery power, but stretching things wings will allow it to stop relying on those batteries and significantly extend the time it can stay in space. So solar array deploy takes about 12 minutes, we have four solar arrays that we need to deploy and latch. These will provide power to the spacecraft on its journey to distant retrograde orbit and all the way back to Earth. Once these are properly configured, again, Orion will no longer need to rely solely on battery power. And we expect this to be done about 30 minutes after liftoff. Right now, we're 19 minutes since liftoff today. Uh, Orion is now traveling 17,175 miles per hour. 
We're continuing to hear good calls here in Mission Control Houston from the flight controllers monitoring the mission. A little bit about these solar arrays as we wait. Uh, again, we heard the call that the deploy has been initiated. We'll hear a little bit more about that um, once they start to unfold. These four solar arrays generate 11 kilowatts of power, which is enough electricity to power two three-bedroom houses, and they have a wingspan of 63 feet. Just one of these six and a half by six and a half foot panels has uh, 1,250 solar cells. So you're looking at a total of 15,000 solar cells. Now we just heard the call that all four solar arrays have been released. So we initially heard the initiation call. That command had been sent. Now those four solar arrays are released. Again, this is about a 12 minute process. The solar arrays will deploy straight and you're getting a live view right now. This is really exciting. Uh, they'll eventually be swept back against the vehicle prior to translunar injection burn to prevent any loads from breaking or damaging the arrays. And on the end of each solar array is a camera that will capture imagery for us throughout the mission, along with a few other cameras placed outside and inside the spacecraft to help us monitor and perform various other inspections. Of course, if you recall the Apollo capsule design, there were no solar arrays. We had fuel cells instead. So this design with arrays gives us the opportunity to stay in orbit longer since we practically have no limit to the energy available for use from the sun. Coming up on 21 minutes since liftoff. Orion is attached to the interim cryogenic propulsion stage. You can see those four solar arrays unfolding now. And again, Artemis 1 is a flight test. It's paving the way for a sustainable presence at the moon. Looking forward to the future, Gateway will be our space station in lunar orbit. And we have some similarities and differences in the solar arrays unfolding right now on Orion and those that'll be on Gateway. So like we're seeing now, these are deploying autonomously. Uh, the Gateway solar arrays will as well. And while these generate those 11 kilowatts of power, the two rollout solar arrays, or ROSAs, on Gateway will generate 60 kilowatts of power. That ROSA design is currently being tested aboard the space station. We have two new ones installed and a spacewalk conducted earlier today, preparing for another set. Coming up on 22 minutes since liftoff today, Orion and the interim cryogenic propulsion stage traveling over 16,800 miles per hour. The solar arrays deploying now are part of the European service module. It's comprised of 20,000 parts and components. The service module was developed as part of an agreement between NASA and the European Space Agency, or ESA. This is the first time NASA is using a European-built system as a critical element to power an American spacecraft. Coming up now in 24 minutes into the flight of Artemis 1, spacecraft now traveling at 16,500 miles per hour around the Earth. We are in solar array deploy and we have confirmation all four arrays are deployed. And with our launch at 141 Eastern time this morning. We are looking for a perigee raise maneuver about 53 minutes into uh, today's flight. Again, we are now 25 minutes and 47 seconds into the flight and we have a complete deployment of all four solar arrays. Orion's journey to the moon continues as planned. Again, looking forward to that perigee raise maneuver. That'll be coming up uh, again at about 53 minutes into the mission, so about 27 minutes from now. During the perigee raise maneuver, the interim cryogenic propulsion stage will use its RL-10 engine to lift the lowest point of Orion in Earth's orbit. The current orbit is more of an oval shape than a perfect circle, and this burn will raise that point closest to Earth and make the orbit more circular. This will also include a checkout of Orion's systems and any adjustments to the solar arrays. It'll be a short burn, less than 30 seconds long, but critical to keep us on track. And it also prepares us for the next engine burn to send Orion to the moon. That's the translunar injection burn. That'll come up a little later, which is a longer burn, another firing of the RL-10 engine on the interim cryogenic propulsion stage.
We caught a glimpse there of those solar arrays, and with all four solar arrays properly deployed, Orion's journey to the moon continues, and we've got more operational updates coming up shortly. Coming up on Perigee Ray's maneuver about two minutes from now, uh, we are now 51 minutes into the flight of Artemis 1 after lifting off at 1.47 a.m. Eastern time from Kennedy Space Center. The vehicle now traveling over 14,600 miles per hour. So during Orion's orbit of Earth, it reaches an apogee and a perigee. The apogee is the highest point above Earth's surface and the perigee is the lowest. Therefore, this perigee raise maneuver is a firing of the ICPS RL-10 engine and it's going to raise the lowest point of Orion's orbit over Earth. This also included a checkout of Orion's systems and any adjustments to the solar arrays. All four of those solar arrays, as you can see, are swept back. That's going to keep them from having any loads imparted that might damage them uh, for use later in the mission. This also, uh, the perigee raise maneuver, will put us in the proper position for the translunar injection burn. That's that really big and long burn that we need to send us to the moon. We're about one minute away from the perigee raise maneuver. This is a shorter burn. It's a less than 30 seconds. About 45 seconds until the perigee raise maneuver. Coming up on 53 minutes into today's mission, and we are standing by for the start of the perigee raise maneuver. Again, this is a firing of the RL-10 engine on the interim cryogenic propulsion stage. It's less than 30 seconds long. And we have confirmation of perigee raise maneuver ignition and full thrust. This is a live view from the spacecraft. Again, a really short burn. We're standing by for the cutoff. And we have confirmation of perigee raise maneuver cut off. Flight dynamics officer reporting on the loops here at Mission Control Houston that it was a good burn. We are now 54 minutes into the flight, Orion traveling 14,700 miles per hour, and that was the perigee raise maneuver lifting the lowest part of Orion's orbit around the Earth and putting us right where we want to be for the translunar injection burn. We're looking for that translunar injection burn to happen about one hour and 26 minutes after launch, so about 30 minutes from now. That'll be that long burn that helps us break free from the pull of Earth's gravity and commits the spacecraft to a lunar trajectory. And we had a great ride to orbit today. We are now one hour and two minutes since we launched the Artemis 1 mission. Orion is traveling with the interim cryogenic propulsion stage now almost 15,000 miles per hour. We recently saw the perigee raise maneuver. That's where we lifted the lowest point of Orion's orbit around the Earth and it puts us in the perfect position to prepare us for translunar injection burn coming up in about 25 minutes. We are one hour, six minutes, and 30 seconds into the flight of Artemis 1, now traveling over 15,200 miles per hour. Again, we've recently had the perigee raise maneuver, and in less than 20 minutes now, we'll be looking for the translunar injection burn that Dan just showcased that's going to send us to the moon. But our mission started off with an epic show from the Space Launch System. And one hour and 13 minutes, 30 seconds since liftoff today. We are looking towards translunar injection burn, now about 13 minutes away. That's going to send us to the moon. But the Orion spacecraft is designed to carry four crew members to lunar orbit, which we're preparing for on Artemis II. NASA astronaut Randy Bresnik brought us through the hatch of the vehicle to show us where those future crew members will live and work during their journey. This is the Orion Crew Station. 
where the crew will be when they fly the vehicle. As you can see, the commander seat is on the left, the pilot seat is on the right. Compared to the space shuttle, which had over 1,200 switches, controls, and circuit breakers, Artemis astronauts will have much less, only about 63. Inside, the crew of four can live and work for up to 21 days at a time, which is several days longer than the previous crewed Apollo missions to the moon. The interior is about 30% larger than those Apollo-era capsules to give more crew living and working space. Everything crew needs is packed right under the floor, thanks to the Orion stowage system. Under these panels is space for everything ranging from food, clothing, sleeping bags, to science and camera equipment, and even the tools necessary to perform repairs if required. On the upper part of the crew compartment, or what we call the overhead, is the docking compartment, a crucial component to future exploration. It allows crews to dock the Orion capsule to Gateway, NASA's next generation lunar outpost. Once they dock, crews will have the ability to board the lunar landers also attached to the Gateway and then head down to the surface of the moon. Through these windows, the four crew members will have amazing front row seats on their journey to and from the moon. Do you remember Apollo 8 and Bill Anders' famous photo of Earthrise as they came around the moon and saw it for the first time? Imagine being one of those first crew members on Orion having their own modern day Earthrise and knowing they are traveling farther from Earth than humans have ever traveled before. Thanks to thousands of people from across the country and around the world who have helped with the research, design, construction, testing, and more testing. My fellow astronauts and I know that whoever gets selected for future Artemis missions, they're gonna have the journey of a lifetime on board the spectacular vehicle we call Orion. We're now coming up on 10 minutes until the translunar injection burn. Again, Orion is still attached to the interim cryogenic propulsion stage. That RL-10 engine is what's going to perform the burn for us. For TLI, coming up in about seven minutes from now. Again, that's one of a long, that's a long burn for us, about 18 minutes long. And this is a live view from the spacecraft. You can see from this view, we have all four of those solar array wings swept back. Orion now traveling off the northwest coast of Australia towards the Pacific Ocean. This translunar injection burn will begin to take it away from the Earth, breaking it free from the pull of gravity. We're standing by for confirmation that the burn has started. We have confirmation from the booster officer that the translunar injection burn has begun and that we are at maximum thrust. Again, this is a long burn, about 18 minutes. It commits us to a lunar trajectory. This ICPS firing now is an RL-10 engine. It's a design that's been around since the 1960s, and it's a proven, reliable engine. This single engine has 25,000 pounds of thrust. We've already seen the ICPS in action today as it powered the perigee raise maneuver just about an hour ago. And if you look in the background, you can see the uh, sunset of the Earth. This is the closest Orion will be to the Earth until it begins its return home. Right now, we're about 382 miles above the Earth's surface. And to put it into perspective, we are approximately 252,670 miles away from the moon. I'm going to keep reporting that number. And by the end of the translunar injection burn, you will see that start to decrease. We are going to continue to grow uh, closer to the moon and further away from Earth. This really helps us break free from gravity. Now traveling at 17,743 miles per hour, we're about a minute and a half into the burn. And although this is the last burn for the interim cryogenic propulsion stage, there are other burns that'll take place throughout the mission to direct Orion exactly where we want it to be. Those include the outbound trajectory correction burns, the first of which will happen later today. We also have the outbound powered flyby, the return powered flyby, and others. Burns after the ICPS separates will be conducted by using the single main engine on the service module, eight auxiliary thrusters on the base of the service module, or 24 smaller thrusters.
Coming up on two and a half minutes into the translunar injection burn, and we're now traveling over 18,000 miles per hour. Again, that speed is gonna increase as well. This is really gonna push Orion toward the moon. And we are now 252,400 miles away from the moon. Now over 13 minutes into the translunar injection burn, putting us less than five minutes away from cutoff. We have had a nominal burn so far. That RL-10 engine continues to fire at maximum thrust, 25,000 pounds of thrust. We're now traveling over 21,730 miles per hour. And we've just heard the call for priority one, meaning we have reached the uh, point at which we could return at lunar return or similar speeds, testing the heat shield as required ahead of flight for Artemis II. Now over 14 minutes into the translunar injection burn, less than four minutes until cutoff, traveling now at over 21,900 miles per hour. Now less than three minutes away from cutoff of the interim cryogenic propulsion stage and coming up on one hour and 42 minutes into the Artemis One mission. The RL-10 engine on the interim cryogenic propulsion stage continues to fire as planned at maximum thrust. Again, this is about an 18 minute burn. That's uh, about twice as long as the ride to orbit today. So that just shows how much power we need to break free from the pull of Earth and take us to the moon. 16 minutes now into the translunar injection burn. Orion traveling at over 22,276 miles per hour. About a minute and a half now until cutoff of the interim cryogenic propulsion stage. Again, this being an 18 minute burn. We are now 248,280 miles away from the moon and continuing to grow closer, 605 miles away from Earth and continuing to increase that distance. Less than a minute now until cutoff of the ICPS and the end of the translunar injection burn. We've had a good burn all the way through so far. And one hour, 44 minutes since launch today. And we have cutoff of the interim cryogenic propulsion stage, which has committed Orion to the translunar conjection. The spacecraft is moon bound. Orion is now traveling at 22,500 miles per hour, 247,450 miles away from Earth. Now that the interim cryogenic propulsion stage has completed its translunar injection burn, it is no longer needed to propel us to the moon. It's done its job and it will separate from Orion. After it separates, those 10 CubeSats we discussed will be deployed from the Orion stage adapter, which is below the service module and above the ICPS. Each payload will be ejected with a spring mechanism from dispensers installed on the Orion stage adapter. And again, these will help us study the moon and space weather, test innovative propulsion technologies, analyze the effects of radiation on organisms, and provide high resolution imagery of the Earth and moon. The CubeSat deploys will start just short of about four hours after launch. Once those CubeSats are deployed, the ICPS will be on track for disposal in a heliocentric orbit, meaning it will closely circle the sun until destroyed. The next change we'll see is for the ICPS to separate from Orion and the service module. Those will continue flying free on their journey toward the moon.
It's now been an hour, 47 minutes and 30 seconds into the first flight of the Artemis program. Orion now traveling 21,860 miles per hour, 1,129 miles away from Earth. That stage separation from the interim cryogenic propulsion stage, again, uh, should be about 10 minutes after the translunar injection burn is complete, so approximately seven minutes from now. Shortly after ICPS separation, Orion's service module will fire its auxiliary thrusters to move the spacecraft a safe distance away from the expended stage. Orion continues on an outbound path to the moon, and the Orion stage adapter attached to the interim cryogenic propulsion stage will deliver several small payloads over several deployments. We're now over one hour, 51 minutes since launch today from the uh, Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Orion is traveling attached to the interim cryogenic propulsion stage, but not for much longer. We look for that separation to happen in about five minutes. At that point, Orion will still be flying attached to the service module. And in this animation, you can see the service module directly below the capsule. Those solar array wings are deployed. The spacecraft now traveling over 20,570 miles per hour, continuing to gr increase its distance from Earth, now over 1,780 miles away, continuing to decrease its distance from the moon, 245,150 miles away.
hearing confirmation from teams here in Mission Control Houston that the solar arrays are in their proper configuration for interim cryogenic propulsion stage separation. Again, we just saw the translunar injection burn, a successful approximately 18 minute burn that has helped Orion break free from the pull of Earth's gravity and sending us toward the moon. We're now standing by for separation from that stage now that it has done its job for Orion. However, it still has a job to do. It will help uh, eject some CubeSats that will help us study the moon, Earth, and the space environment. Orion now traveling at 19,700 miles per hour, 2,270 miles away from Earth. We're expecting that stage separation to happen in about a minute. As you can see, we have confirmation of interim cryogenic propulsion stage from Orion. With the Earth in the background and the moon is our destination, Artemis generation, we are going. It's been one hour, 57 minutes, and 40 seconds since Orion launched atop the SLS from Kennedy Space Center in Florida at 1.47 a.m. Eastern Time. After a smooth ride to orbit, a perigee raise maneuver, and a translunar injection burn conducted by the interim cryogenic propulsion stage, Orion is now flying free, attached to the European Service Module and on its journey to the moon. That might be the end of today's broadcast, but the Artemis One mission has only just begun. We'll continue live coverage for major milestones, including the outbound powered flyby and other major burns. Thank you for joining us today for our coverage of the Artemis One mission. We leave you now with a rendition of our national anthem performed by Josh Robin and jazz pianist Herbie Hancock, followed by a look back on today's historic liftoff as we look toward every milestone in this mission. Artemis generation, we are going. <laughs>